Hi everyone and welcome to our summary about our introduction to biotechnology. What we're going to be doing in this video then is having a look at the section of the specification 6.2.1e which is basically having a little bit of an overview about how we use microorganisms in different biotech processes and basically why we do this. So we'll have a look at a few key processes, as you can see, brewing, baking, cheese making, yogurt production, penicillin production, insulin and bioremediation. The first thing we need to do then is understand what on earth we're talking about when we use this phrase biotechnology. Now, if we just do the most obvious thing in life, we split that word up into the two sections. Bio is all to do with living things. So think about biology, the study of living things, and then technology is some kind of usually industrial process or something that's a device of some description. So this is really looking at some kind of advanced process. So we're really looking here at an industrial process. So if we break that word down, living things, industrial process, we're using living organisms or parts of a living organism in some kind of industrial process. So what we're doing here is we're using the actual biological system in some way to improve something in industry. Now, this isn't new. This is the thing. When we consider biotechnology, so using a living thing for some kind of an industrial process, we've been doing that for thousands of years, folks. So if we go back to some of the earliest forms, then we go back to good old brewing. So brewing is obviously where we're producing alcohol. And this is something that we can see through many cultures throughout human history. We found alcohol as an early thing. We liked it, we stuck with it. And that's one of our oldest forms of biotechnology, using a living organism to make alcoholic beverages, basically. How does it do it? Well, we're just gonna use yeast. Now, all we're going to do is carry out a fermentation process of the maltose that we find in germinating barley, in one example, and that then is going to produce alcohol as the end product of the process. Other processes that have been around for a really long time, obviously baking, so making bread. We've had yeast involved in that for a very, very long time. Making cheese and yogurt production. Again, these are not new. These are things that we've been doing for a long time throughout human history. If we come a little bit closer to modern times, but not that much these days, World War One, then we actually used this particular clostridium in order to produce acetone, which we then used in explosives, because obviously war is to do with a lot of blowing things up, and therefore by producing the acetone, we could then produce explosives from clostridium, which is actually a type of bacteria. In World War II, then we actually had a slightly more positive use, I suppose you could say, in the fact that we had our penicillium, which was then being used to produce our penicillin. So finally, we actually had a method for treating a lot of infections that people got. All those things that we were blowing up, for example, cause injuries in people in not very hygienic conditions when you're in a trench, and therefore lots of infections occurred. People used to die of them. Penicillin avoided a lot of death. That's a good thing. Now we're gonna to go to the modern day. So in terms of how we use biotechnology today, then we can split it up into basically four areas. Food, pharmaceutical drugs, enzymes, and other things. If we take food first of all then, we're still producing alcohol. We've not lost that love of alcoholic beverages as the human race, so we are still going to be using our yeast, which is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, in order to actually produce the ethanol that we find in wine or beer. We also find that still used in terms of our baking, so bread making. We need that bread to rise. If you've watched any of those baking shows, then you know that we've got to put it in that proving drawer for a while. So that's all to do with allowing the yeast in order to produce the carbon dioxide makes the dough rise nicely. We also still produce our yogurt and our cheese manufacturing. So that means that we're going to have a type of bacteria called lactobacillus for this one. And more modern ones, not been around for a huge number of years in reality, is 
obviously we have an increasing number of vegetarians in the world today and it's not just a case of you're going to eat a bunch of vegetables not quite vegetarianism done right now if we're talking about vegetarian foods we now have the ability to produce food from a stuff called mycoprotein now myco is all to do with basically fungi so it's a protein that comes from a fungus in this case so you can see there the species fusarium venenatum is the one that we're going to use to produce mycoprotein which is in things like your corn for example and then we can also carry out fermentation on soya beans using either yeast which is an old favorite or we could use this aspergillus fungus instead so we've got a range of different uses there in modern day food industry in terms of the pharmaceutical industry then we are still going to be producing things like penicillin from our penicillium so that's one example of an antibiotic but it's not the only one so we will use a range of different microorganisms to produce antibiotics and one that we will have encountered at GCSE for sure is our ability to make human insulin through the use of genetically modified bacteria. So we take the human insulin gene from a human cell and then we're going to insert it into a bacterial cell using that genetic modification technique. Third category are the enzymes category. One that's probably in your homes is in your washing powders or washing liquids so when we wash our clothes we've actually identified the fact that if we've got enzymes in that washing liquid it makes it better at getting out sort of stains and things like this from our clothes so what we actually do is we're using bacterial enzymes lipase which hopefully we remember is the enzyme that's going to break down our lipids and protease which is the enzyme that breaks down our proteins. So what we actually find there is we can improve washing powders by adding enzymes from our bacteria. We also use enzymes from bacteria, and again, this is protease enzymes, to tenderize meat. So you can actually get this powder basically that you can put on meat and it's going to help tenderize it just contains protease enzymes starts to break down those proteins in advance if we go into kind of an overlap between our food and enzyme industries here then when we actually want to get juice from fruits then we can use another enzyme called a pectinase which helps us to get the juice out because the pectinase is going to affect this substance called pectin and therefore it makes the juice easier to extract and then the other category this is some of the newer techniques i suppose so we can have a look at biogas now biogas is basically a type of gas we can then burn as part of obviously electricity generation etc or in some countries in homes using anaerobic bacteria so basically we're going to provide those anaerobic bacteria with some kind of a substrate that they can then utilize within anaerobic respiration and they're going to produce this gas that we can then burn at a later stage for various reasons either heating or producing electricity and then bioremediation so bio is again we're still looking at our living things and remediation is basically a step we take to restore things so what we're looking at here really is using living organisms to restore something now depending on what we're trying to restore determines whether we're using bacteria fungi combination etc but a good example here is in oil spills where we can now use certain species of bacteria that actually utilize the hydrocarbons within crude oil as a food substrate basically so that means that by obviously applying these bacteria to the oil spill they start to then break down those hydrocarbons within the crude oil and therefore help to alleviate the issues of that spill so why do we do this we need to know some of the advantages of why we're actually interested in this whole process of biotechnology in the first place well first of all a pretty generic one here is that microorganisms are cheap 
and they're easy to grow. They don't need much in reality. They're just quite happy to grow in a tank somewhere. Now, because they're quite easy to grow, they don't have any specific requirements, then we can have much lower fuel costs because we don't have to have really high temperatures for things. We don't have to have high pressures. So we're avoiding some of those pitfalls of our chemical engineering processes. And therefore, that means we can save some money in our production. They're also allowing year round production of this particular product because they're not dependent on climate. It's not like certain plants that are only going to be able to grow at certain points of the year. We can avoid all of that and just use our microorganisms instead that grow all year round. Not season dependent, great stuff. Another advantage, we can actually feed these microorganisms on byproducts from other industries. So when we produce one type of food, we'll have some bits left over, for example. We can then just utilize that in another biotechnology process, and those microorganisms will use that waste material basically to produce something else useful like the biogas, for example. And finally, because our bacteria have a very rapid rate of reproduction, this means we can create large populations really quickly. And if we can create large populations quickly, we can then generate large amounts of products quickly as well. A few more on this slide then. We can easily modify their genetic makeup. So we've already seen the example of that with the human insulin and obviously the fact that we can insert that gene into our E. coli bacteria and therefore produce human insulin. They're simple, therefore we can modify them quite easily. If we're comparing things like the production of proteins for our human consumption from bacteria versus animals, far fewer ethical considerations. No one really cares or demonstrates about the welfare of a bacterial or a fungal cell, but they do about your cows, sheep, etc. So fewer ethical considerations is always a good answer for a number of biotech processes here. We can harvest these products very easily because the very nature of how these organisms work, they tend to secrete these products into the surrounding medium that they're growing in. So we can literally just kind of run it off. And last one on there, lower downstream processing costs because the product is either pure or it's easier to isolate than when we compare it to those chemical engineering processes. Because we're literally looking at our microorganism, usually just secreting it into the growth medium, that's far easier to extract than a whole range of different chemicals going together to create something. It is worth mentioning that we have some other forms of biotechnology, just in case they crop up anywhere. So we've already mentioned genetic modification of microorganisms, but we also use biotechnology in terms of modifying things like mammals. Now, we're not obviously changing huge quantities of their genome here. It's little tweaks that we're really doing. So some good examples there then are the goats that we've actually got to produce spider silk in their milk. So we've genetically modified our goats in order to produce this spider silk in their milk there. Now, why do we want to do that? Why do we want goats basically producing spider silk in their milk? Well, we can actually use that to make this substance called biosteel. Now, biosteel, obviously bio living organisms and steel. If we think about steel and what we know, it's obviously used in a lot of structural features. In terms of what we're using this biosteel for, this one is very much an area of interest as far as replacement ligaments and tendons go. Because if you actually consider the strength of spider silk, then it's actually incredibly strong for the size of that fiber. Now, if we can then basically utilize this in order to produce this biosteel material, then we could replace lig ligaments and tendons within the body that obviously have to withstand quite serious forces there. And we've also got the example of using cows to produce human antibodies in their blood. So we can kind of use cows to produce antibodies for key viral infections that we can then obviously administer to human patients. 
and you can see there they actually did this with COVID-19. Some other areas just to be aware of that also fall under this umbrella term of biotechnology. We're looking at gene technology and genetic modification there, gene therapy, which we've mentioned in another area of the course. Selective breeding comes under this, as does cloning, the whole process of immunology, that vast field, and any uses of enzymes in industrial processes. So we've got a whole range of other areas of biotechnology. The good news is we're not looking at them all in great detail in your A-level biology course. Otherwise, it would take more than the two years that we have to do this. As always, I recommend that you subscribe to the channel so you can see when a new video is uploaded. And of course, head on over to the website so that you can pull out any additional resources that may be of use to you through helping you study your A-level biology.